chapter two of the Communist Manifesto, uh, Proletarians and Communists. All right, let's take a look at that. Chapter two, Proletarians and Communists. In what relation do communists stand to the proletarians as a whole? The communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties. They have no interests separate and apart from those of the proletariat as a whole. They do not set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. The communists are distinguished from other working class parties by this only one. In the national struggles of the proletarians of different countries, they point out and bring to the front the common interest of the entire proletariat independently of all nationality. In the, and two, in the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeoisie has to pass through, they always and everywhere represent the interest of the movement as a whole. Okay, so uh, this is not, uh, latching on to particular interests within the proletariat, within the working class, the communists try to maintain a view of inter the international proletariat across all countries and to not undermine the interests of one part of the proletariat in order to serve the interest of another part of the proletariat. That's a divide and conquer strategy that the bourgeoisie like to use. They mobilize a particular portion of the proletariat and, and break them off from the rest of it so that, that they can uh, disorganize the proletariat itself. The communists always want to create an international unified vision for the proletariat all across the globe. Now, this is very interesting in relationship to the ecological cataclysm. If we're going to address the ecological cataclysm, we have to have solidarity amongst all of those affected all around the world. And primarily at the moment, that is poorer people all around the world, but more and more, and I think we'll, you will see this in your own life in the coming decades, surprisingly, uh, I think you will be surprised by how much the, the, the destruction of the ecological cataclysm is going to impact your own life and people that you would think would be secure from such impacts, uh, seeing you know, people that might seem privileged uh, really having their lives destroyed by this. So, uh, and, and that's kind of part of this class consciousness. You know, there are people who, in relationship to the ecological cataclysm, feel like they're not going to be impacted. But more and more, you're going to see these people falling out of privilege into this lower class of ecological victims. And, and, and we're all kind of falling that direction. I mean, uh, it's, it's really uh, something that's going to be very society-wide, and there's going to be this growing large majority of people that are really suffering under the ecological cataclysm. Can a communist approach uh, be effective? If we took this attitude of not playing the interest of one devastated population against another devastated population, but we really try to keep them united and keep them growing as a political force all around the, all around the globe, is that something that can translate into uh, action uh, on the ecological crisis or at, at least help us um, weather out the ecological cataclysm you know, and, and if it gets, once it gets underway, which it probably will get underway, if it does get underway, once it does get underway, uh, you know, we're talking about hundreds of years before it works itself out, at least, if not thousands of years. Um, 
And so a communistic way of, especially in this paragraph, how like they're saying we're not going to play one particular interest against another. It's everyone who's affected by the crisis that is is part of the class of people that 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 whose interests we are concerned with, and we got to create unity and solidarity across all suffering people. Um, that might be something that's very valuable in the ecological cataclysm. And, and it might be something to think about if you're interested in some more particularistic sort of movement like Black Lives Matter or feminism or, or LBGTQ uh, rights and things like that, is particularistic concerns, do those sometimes undermine a broader solidarity that in the long run might be more beneficial. And, and of course, if we're talking about um, unifying groups like that, uh, and especially people who are falling victim to the ecological cataclysm, you know, this is not really a proletariat that we're talking about anymore. It seems much more like the poor, like Romero and Gutierrez were talking about, and maybe that Puebla that Dussel is talking about. So this, uh, uh, especially I think in light of the ecological cataclysm, Dussel's category of the Puebla starts to make a lot more sense. And especially because he's particularly interested in bringing in indigenous viewpoints, uh, the, the viewpoints of indigenous uh, Latin Americans, but also indigenous people all over the world who may have a, a very different orientation towards the ecology that we need to learn from. Uh, of course, that's not to say that all indigenous people have the right attitude towards the ecology. Let's not make that mistake. Um, <clears throat> But this uh, communistic idea is interesting. And if we define communism in this way, okay, uh, then it does fit very nicely into the ecological crisis. And also just the word communism is nice because it's about uh, protecting the common, uh, the commons, uh, it, you know, Marx and Engels are thinking more about the commons of industrial means of production, like the factory, that the factory should become part of the commons, that all the people share in common and manage on a communal basis, just like the commons used to be managed before they were enclosed. And we've seen that idea of the enclosure of the commons come up in lots of different aspects. So hopefully that, that concept is clearer to you now. Uh, but uh, the ecology, is naturally a commons, just in the way like especially that John Locke spoke of, the whole world was a commons at one point. And it's only by individuals enclosing portions of it, sometimes legitimately, sometimes illegitimately, that we uh, you know, get property as we know it. And we're talking about big property, substantial property, long-term, stable property that's given by social convention to certain classes of people and not given by social conventions to other classes of people. Um, it's only th there that we get property coming about. And then what about the ecology? Who owns the, the ecology? Who owns the air? Who owns the water? Now, transnational corporations are trying to buy those things up uh, as quickly as possible. Is that legitimate or is that illegitimate? And what are they gonna do once they buy it up? They're gonna not allow people to drink because they own the water, not allow people to breathe because they own the air. Um, and and what about all the destruction that transnational corporations have done to the commons? That in fact, most of it is not owned by anybody right now. It really is a commons like the open oceans, but they've been fished to such an extent 
that fish populations are, are, are dropping dramatically. Uh, fish are going extinct, all sorts of species of aquatic animals and other animals are going extinct. These are all things that nobody owns. This is common property to all. Why are we allowing this? Well, we're in the midst of the sixth great extinction uh, in the geological record of the planet. Why are we allowing the sixth great extinction to take place? Everybody owns that natural wealth in common. That's part of the commons. Why are we allowing transnational corporations to destroy the natural processes of the ecology which sustains human life? Uh, and if we think of that notion of the commons and how it's connected to communism, um, that might be very uh, helpful in the struggle for liberation as we move deeper and deeper into the ecological cataclysm. So the definition is quite nice, something to think about and something to compare to what Dussel is talking about. Okay, the communists therefore are on the one hand practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of every country, that section will push it, which pushes forward all others. On the other hand, theoretically, they have over the greatest mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, the direction when things need to go, the conditions and the ultimate general results of the proletarian movement. The immediate aim of the communist is the same as that of all the other proletarian parties, formation of the proletariat into a class, overthrow of the bourgeois supremacy, conquest of political power by the proletariat. Okay, and, and again, in the ecological cataclysm, as people become more aware that they are victims or, or likely to become, become victims very soon, will they organize together and will they have the political will to oust those who are driving us deeper and deeper into the ecological cataclysm uh, or is, are the victims just going to acquiesce and, and allow those in power to continue to destroy the basis of their children's lives? Um, what do you think? So, you know, uh, for all I said earlier about the, the communist revolution not taking place, if we start to reinterpret communism in terms of the ecological cataclysm and the commons of the ecology, are we reaching a revolutionary moment? Uh, is the time right for revolutionary action rather than incrementalism? Because incrementalism, uh, you know, we have these COP uh, conferences with the UN, we have uh, the Green New Deal and things like these proposals that are incremental, uh, all the while the crisis is getting worse, and worse. These incremental reforms are not up to the task. They're not uh, taking effect quickly and uh, intensively enough to actually turn things around. It's getting worse and worse day by day. Uh, do we reach a, a, a moment, a tipping point, where revolution is the only way out of the mess? And can that be organized on communistic terms? Or do we need to think more in the way that, that Dussel is thinking in terms of the Puebla? Uh, you know, how do how does that work out? So this is this is a good topic, you know, for your final paper. The theoretical conclusions of the communists are in no way based on ideas or principles that have been invented or discovered by this or that would be universal reformer. They merely express in general terms actual relations springing from an existing class struggle from a historical movement go, going on under our very eyes. The abolition of existing property relations is not at all a distinctive feature of communism. Okay. Um, so, uh, the communism is not historical. It's merely observing the historical situation as it's unfolding and clearly describing the interests of the proletariat internationally at large. Okay. Um, 
And, and that's something that we might want to keep in mind in relationship to the ecological cataclysm. As the crisis gets worse and worse, does a communistic a, interpretation of that crisis make more sense? Is it making sense right now? Um, what would get us to the point where, it, you know, how bad does it have to get before it starts to make sense? Can we start organizing on this principle now? Would that be helpful? Or do you see some other way? Is this, are there problems with going in this direction? And does Dussel's uh, ideas of reorienting uh, politics and philosophy uh, help us to, would that help us to address the ecological cataclysm? Or you can apply it to other issues as well. But, um, but as you can see, my, my head is really wrapped up and, and where I think the relevance is for the communist manifesto and even what Dussel is saying, my head is always wrapped up in this ecological cataclysm. Uh, it's just shaping up to be uh, a disaster, of course, but also it's shaping up to be a revolutionary moment. I, I, I have the sense that people are, it's gonna get so bad for people that they won't remain inactive. They'll have to do something. And will that revolution uh, take some sort of reactionary direction, uh, you know, and go in weird, um, you know, distasteful, ugly ways? Or is there a way of making uh, the crisis of the ecology actually get us to the point of something that looks like the socialist revolution that is something where uh, society at large and especially those less privileged in the society are supported and comforted through the crisis uh, and, and and you might be somebody who is reactionary and and wants to like do a genocide to solve the ecological cat I mean, you can make that argument there are people who make these arguments uh, it's just not me. That's not where I'm coming from. But if you have some reactionary, you know, antisocial sort of uh, approach to things, um, I need for you to argue against socialism and communism and do so. Uh, you have to, you know, you, you need to argue in terms of the course material that I've set up. And, and obviously my inclination is toward socialism, right? And trying to help the, 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 the lowest classes of society, which ultimately the lowest class of society as I see it shaping up are the victims, uh, the most severe victims of the ecological cataclysm, but that that is by and large going to subsume almost the entire population uh, within a number of decades. If, if things aren't radically changed. And so even the prospect of that happening might be enough for revolutionary change in addressing the ecological cataclysm that maybe doesn't end up, you know, it might be more incremental in, in its impact. Uh, and that would be fine if, as long as we can keep the ecological cataclysm from happening. But at a certain point, things are gonna go haywire and hopefully they can go haywire politically in the, in the direction of socialism. Otherwise, the cataclysm is, is much worse than it needs to be. A, a social revolution, a socialist revolution is possible. Uh, and the alternatives, in my view, are disastrous because it's gonna make people suffer much more than they need to. Okay, <clears throat> so if you want to argue against that, argue against that, but make your argument. Uh... All right, all property relations in the past have continually been subject to historical change consequent upon the change in historical conditions. Here we have historical materialism in a nutshell, property relations are dependent on historical conditions. Property relations also reflect, as they've said above, and which Marx really develops in 
Capital, Volume One, is that property relations and all economic relations, political economic relations, reflect social relations. So the social hierarchy in a more complex way, not just in terms of bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, but a more complex description of the hierarchy within society. And human societies do naturally form into hierarchies. Um, those social relationships are reflected in our political economic uh, realities of day-to-day -day work life and, and other economic relationships. Um, so historical conditions reflect political economic day-to-day -day relationships and those political economic day-to-day -day relationships reflect social relationships. And, and so here we have historical materialism in a nutshell. All right, in this one little sentence. The French Revolution, for example, abolished feudal property in favor of bourgeois property. Okay. And the French Revolution, you know, he's talking about the short durée French Revolution of 1789, in which the commoners, uh, you know, did take over. And then that property class uh, has, was much more influential all the way up to this day. Now, the French Revolution, as I describe it in this long durée sort of way, is not over yet in 1848, um, but a lot of the property relationships have already been disrupted. The distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. But modern bourgeois property is the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and appropriating products that is based on class antagonisms, on the exploitation of the many by the few. And this is like the, the 1% versus the 99%. In this sense, the theory of communists may be summed up in the single sentence, ab abolition of private property. Uh, and again, this is property like John Locke was discussing, not minor individual stuff, but property, primary land and the, the production and things like that, where your ownership of it, if you don't put it to good use, hurts the life of other people around you. We communists have been reproached with the desire of, of abolishing the right of personally acquiring property as the fruit of man's own labor which property is alleged to be the groundwork of all personal freedom, activity, and independence. Hard won, self-acquired, self-earned property. Do you mean the property of petty, the petty artisan and a, the small peasant, a form of pro property that preceded the bourgeois form? There's no need to abolish that. That's not what we're talking about. The development of industry has to a great extent already destroyed it anyway and is still destroying it on a daily basis? Or do you mean bourgeois private property? But does wage labor create any property for the laborer? Not a bit. It creates capital. In other words, that kind of property which exploits wage labor and which cannot increase except upon the condition of beginning a new supply of wage labor for fresh exploitation. Property in this present form, in its present form, is based on the antagonism of capital and wage labor. Let us examine both sides of this antagonism. Okay, so private property as capital, like what the owners of a factory, that property, that's what we're concerned about. To be a, capital, to be a capitalist is to have not only a purely personal, but a social status in production. Capital is a collective product and only by the united action of many members, nay, in the last resort, only by the united action of all members of society can it be set in motion. So capital is created by everybody in society, but who owns it? Somehow this small minority of capitalists. Capital is, capital is therefore not really a personal, uh, but rather it is a social power. 
and here we get a, a definition of socialism is that things produced by society should be owned by society, not by some privileged class within that society. If we all produce it, then we should all own it as a commons. Um, and now I, you know, earlier I was talking about the commons in relation to the ecology, and that kind of takes us back to an old way of thinking about the commons. But what Marx and Engels are doing here is thinking now about the commons as the capital produced by a factory. So they're really redefining what the commons means in a more abstract political economic way. So it's not just about a patch of ground that gets enclosed, but it's about all the produce of the factory. That should be a commons, but the vast majority of it is appropriated by a small minority of capitalists. Uh, they kind of enclose it politically, economically from all the members of the factory who actually produce it and should own it in common. So that, that's kind of an interesting idea. And, and, and again, th this might be something that is relevant to the ecological cataclysm, at least in coming up with invented strategies on how to avoid the cataclysm or get our way out of it once it gets really uh, turning. When therefore capital is converted into common property, into the property of all members of society, personal property is not therefore transformed into social property. It is only the social character of the property that is changed. Changed. It loses its class character. So again, that's the, it takes the whole society to produce the capital. So naturally, we might say by, by the law of nature in Locke's term, it is the commons. It is common property. It's only a class relationship, a political relationship that allows certain people to appropriate it. Uh, and so when we do away with that class privilege, we're not doing away with the property, we're just returning it to its social character. And we're talking about the capital that's appropriated by capitalists, which you, unless you happen to be an industrial capitalist, do not have, right? If you're a wage earner, you don't have capital, you don't have private property in this bourgeois sense. Let us now take wage labor. The average price of wage labor is the minimum wage. In other words, that quantum of the means of subsistence, which is absolutely requisite in bare existence as a laborer, just subsistence level, just reproducing yourself. That's the, the, the minimum needed and average wages tend towards this minimum. That's the iron law of wages from uh, David Ricardo. What therefore the wage laborer appropriates by means of his labor merely suffices to prolong and reproduce a bare existence. We by no means intend to abolish this personal appropriation of the products of labor, an appropriation that is made for the maintenance and reproduction of human life. That's not what we're not gonna take away your means of, of existing. And that leaves no surplus wherewith to command the labor of others. Uh, all that we want to do away with is the miserable character of this appropriation under which the laborer lives merely to increase capital and is allowed to live only in so far as the interest of the ruling class requires it. So we're not gonna accumulate capital for the ruling class, we're gonna accu accumulate capital for the vast majority of people and then figure out a way to distribute that. But your subsistence living that you already have, you know, the chump change that you live on in comparison to the capitalist, we're not gonna take that away. You still got your chump change. We're just going to use the common produce of the industrial product, process to actually benefit broadly society. You still get your chump change, right? You still have your your day to day existence that you have now. Uh, hopefully, even a better standard of living. Uh, well, in reality, you would have a better standard of living on average, right? You know. 
uh, everybody would be raised beyond where they are now if they're living at subsistence level. Uh, but, you know, some people are going to be raised more than others. You know, it's a complicated process. So there's no promises made here of greater wealth, really. Uh, but your subsistence level of existence that you're used to, your car, uh, your apartment, your shoes, your dresses, your shirts, um, all that kind of stuff, your TV, you're still going to have all that stuff. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about big money. We're talking about the capital that capitalists are accumulating. That's the only kind of property that matters in bourgeois society. In bourgeois society, living labor is but a means to increase accumulated labor in the form of capital. In communist society, accumulated labor is but a means to widen, to enrich, to promote the existence of the laborer. Okay, and they do envision a future of industrial labor. It's just instead of working for the capitalist, you're working for society. In bourgeois society, therefore, the past dominates the present. In communist society, the present dominates the past. In bourgeois society, capital is independent and has individuality, while the living person is dependent and has no individuality. And the abolition of this state of things is called by the bourgeois abolition of individual uh, individuality and freedom. You don't want to. You don't want to lose your individually and uh, individuality and freedom to to live in a small apartment and go deeper and deeper into debt. That's your individuality and freedom. Communists want to take that away from you. And rightly so. The abolition of bourgeois individuality, bourgeois independence, and bourgeois freedom is undoubtedly aimed at. By freedom is meant, under the present bourgeois conditions of production, free trade, free, free selling and buying. But if selling and buying disappears, free selling and buying disappears also. This talk about free selling and buying and all the other brave words of our bourgeois about freedom in general have a meaning if and only in contrast with restricted selling and buying, with the fettered traders of the Middle Ages, but have no meaning when opposed to the communistic abolition of buying and selling, of the bourgeois conditions of production and of the bourgeoisie itself. You know, when we get rid of the bourgeoisie, there's not gonna be the same kind of market economy, right? Uh, but the ability to live for the worker is gonna be vastly increased. You are horrified at or intending to do away with private property, but in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine tenths of the population. It is ex its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those of nine tenths. So he's saying it's the 10% versus the 90%. You reproach us therefore with intending to do away with a form of property the necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In one word, you reproach us with intending to do away with your property, capitalists, precisely so. That is just what we intend, bourgeois industrial capitalists. We're taking away your property, not the property of everybody else, because they don't really have any property in comparison to you. They got nothing to take. From the moment when labor, uh, when labor can no longer be converted into capital, money or rent into a, a social power capable of being monopolized, in other words, from the moment when individual property can no longer be transformed into bourgeois property, into capital, from that moment, you say individuality vanishes. You must therefore confess that by individuality, you mean no other person than the bourgeois than the middle class owner of property. This person must indeed be swept out of the way and made impossible, sure. Communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive him of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriation. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, claim here. A communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. So now 
once we think of the products of a factory of industrial production as being part of the commons, then in a very Lockean sort of way, they envision that people can legitimately appropriate portions of it if they're, if they're putting their own labor into it and they're using it uh, in a way that does not undermine the natural rights of others within the society. Okay, but now we're just thinking about the commons, not just being just land, but now just all the produce of industrial production. It has been objected that upon the abolition of private property, all work will cease and universal laziness will overtake us. And of course, we hear these kind of silly arguments today. According to this, bourgeois society ought long ago to have gone to the dogs through sheer idleness for those of its members who work, the laborers, the workers, the employees, acquire nothing. And those who acquire anything, they don't work. The capitalists don't work. The owner of the factory doesn't work in the factory. And the workers who work in the factory don't get anything. They barely get a, 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 a minimal subsistence weight. The whole of this objection is but another expression of the tautology that there can no longer be any wage labor when there is no longer any capital. Wage labor depends, uh, capital depends on wage labor. But once you do away with capital, there's no need for wage labor. All objections urged against the communistic mode of producing and appropriating material products have in the same way been urged against the communistic modes of producing and appropriating intellectual products. Just as to the bourgeois, the disappearance of class property is the disappearance of, pr of production itself, so the disappearance of class culture is to him identical with the disappearance of all culture. Bourgeois culture, you know, fancy furniture and drapery and big mansions, uh, when those disappear, that doesn't mean all culture disappears. Uh, here, um, here's something where Dussel uh, might have something to add that, you know, just because bourgeois, the bourgeois center in the North or in the United States uh, disregards, you know, Mexican um, uh, Zapatista, you know, in indigenous people uh, view their culture as inferior and not worth having doesn't mean that it's not a value. And if uh, bourgeois, you know, consumeristic U.S. culture is done away with, it doesn't mean that all culture is done away with. It just means that that bourgeois consumeristic US culture is done away with. Not that all culture is done away. There's a, there's a, there's a ethnocentrism to believing that when your culture goes away, all culture goes away. It's, it's to assume that your culture is better than everybody else's culture. And this is what the bourgeois do. Uh, that culture, the loss of which he laments, the bourgeois, is for the enormous majority a mere training to act as a machine. Again, the cog in the machine thing. But don't wrangle with us so long as you apply to our, attention, our, our, intention, our intended abolition of bourgeois property, the standard of your bourgeois notions of freedom, culture, law, etc., your very ideas are but the outgrowth of the conditions of your bourgeois production and your bourgeois property. Just as your jurisprudence is but the will of your class made into a law for all. A will whose essential character and direction are determined by the economical conditions of the existence of your class, not the vast majority of people. The selfish misconception that induces you the bourgeois, this minority, to transform into eternal laws of nature and of reason, the social form springing from your present mode of production and your form of property, historical relations that rise and disappear in the progress of production, this misconception you share with every ruling class that has preceded you. You know, the, the feudal lords had the same sort of prejudices for their own class. 
What you see clearly in, clearly in the case of ancient property, what you admit in the case of feudal property, you are of course forbidden to admit in the case of your own bourgeois form of property. This is ideology. Abolition of the family, even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. Uh, on what foundation is the present family, the bourgeois family based? On capital, on private gain. In its completely developed form, this family exists only among the bourgeoisie. But this state of things finds its complement in the practical absence of the family among the proletarians and in the public, in public prostitution. The bourgeois family will vanish as a matter of course when its complement vanishes, and both will vanish with the vanishing of capital. Get rid of capital, you get rid of the bourgeois industrialists, get rid of bourgeois industrialists, you get rid of their bourgeois family. Yeah, they can't live like that anymore. Do you charge us with wanting to stop the exploitation of children by their parents? To this crime, we plead guilty. But you will say, we destroy the most hallowed relations when we replace home education by social education, home education by public education. It's destroying the foundations of society, you say. And your education is not that also social? and determined by the social conditions under which you educate in your factory schools, two hours, uh, half hour a day, as we saw uh, in the historical survey. The communists have not invented the intervention of society and education. They do but seek to alter the character of that intervention and to rescue education from the influence of the ruling class. The bourgeois claptrap about the family and education, about the hallowed correlation of parent and child becomes all the more disgusting, the more by the action of, the mod of modern industry, all family ties among the proletarians are torn asunder and their children transformed into simple articles of commerce and instruments of labor, child labor. How does that help the family? Separation of a child uh, taken as an apprentice to the cotton mill. How does that support the family? But you communists would introduce community of women, screams the whole bourgeois and cor chorus. A community of women is like sharing wives, okay? Uh, the bourgeoisie sees, his, sees in his wife a mere instrument of production. He hears that the instruments of production are to be exploited in common and naturally can come to no other conclusion than the lot of being common to all will likewise fall to the women. Because the bourgeoisie only thinks of people as means of production. So even his own wife, he just thinks as a, another commodity. He has not even a suspicion that the real point is to do away with the status of women as mere instruments of production. That women are not commodities. For the rest, nothing is more ridiculous than the virtuous indignation of our bourgeois at the community of women, which they pretend is to be openly and officially established by communists. The communists have no need to introduce community of women. It has existed almost from the time immemorial. Uh, sometimes prostitution is referred to as the oldest profession. Our bourgeois are not content with having the wives and daughters of their proletarians at their disposal in the factory, not to speak of common prostitutes at their disposal for an hourly wage, take the greatest pleasure in seducing each other's bourgeois wives. Now, this is the bourgeoisie who are promiscuous and have all this leisure time to, uh, to seduce their, their neighbor's wife. Bourgeois marriage is in reality a system of wives in common. And thus, at the most, what the communists might possibly be reproached with is that they desire to introduce in substitution for a hypocritically concealed and openly legalized community of women. Because women can do what they want because they're not means of production. They're not commodities to be controlled. For the rest, it is self-evident that the abolition of the present system of production must bring with it the abolition of the community of women springing from that system. In other, way, in other words, a prostitution, both public 
and private, both on the street and behind closed doors. Um, the communists are further reproached with desiring to abolish countries and nationality. The working men have no country. We cannot take from them what they have not got. Can't take what they don't have. Since the proletariat must first of all acquire political supremacy, must rise to be the leading class of the nation, must constitute itself the nation, it is so far itself national, though not in the bourgeois sense of the word, not a bourgeois nation state. National differences and antagonisms between people are daily more and more vanishing owing to the development of the bourgeoisie to freedom of commerce, to the world market, uh, to uniformity in the mode of production and in the conditions of life corresponding thereto. It's the bourgeoisie that are creating a global society. The supremacy of the proletariat will cause them to vanish still faster. United action of the leading civilized countries at least is one of the first conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. Uh, here we see in this sentence, that uh, Marx and Engels believe that the proletariat revolution to socialism can only take place in developed countries, not in underdeveloped countries. Um, and that's where uh, Russia and China then are counterexamples. Uh, and then, then it's like, well, is that really the proletarian revolution? You know, maybe that's part of the problem with these revolutions. Um, but their whole theory kind of breaks down under the scrutiny of the history happening in the subsequent decades after the writing of the Communist Manifesto. So that always has to be taken into account. Um, but again, if we're reinterpreting the commons in terms of the ecology and we're reinterpreting the proletariat as uh, the Puebla maybe of Dussel, but now the Puebla being the vast majority of people who are gonna suffer in the ecological cataclysm. Uh, can we uh, revitalize some of the revolutionary ideas within the communist manifesto? In proportion as the exploitation of one individual by another is put to an end, the exploitation of one nation by another will also be put to an end. Uh, in proportion as the antagonism between classes within the nation vanishes, the hostility of one nation to another will come to an end. The charges against communism made from a religious, a philosophical, and generally from an ideological standpoint are not deserving of serious examination. Does it require deep in intuition to comprehend that man's ideas, views, and con conceptions in one word, man's consciousness changes with every change in the conditions of his material existence, in his social relation, and in his social life. You know, when you change the way that people have to work, and this is for working people that have to go to work, if you change the conditions under which they work, is that gonna change the way they look at life? Yes, certainly, certainly, that's obvious. What else does the history of ideas prove than that intellectual production changes its character in proportion as material production is changed? The ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. Uh, so as society is restructured, the ideas of society are restructured. This is that uh, substructure versus superstructure argument that I mentioned at the beginning of the schematic introduction to political ecology. Uh, so you can take a look back there for that uh, substructure versus superstructure uh, argument. That, that's right here in this paragraph. Um, uh, but the inflection that they put on it is that the ideas really come from the ruling class. And this is where a connection to Dussel really comes out because Dussel wants to say, no, let's not adopt the ideas of, of Cartesian modern philosophy uh, going forward. Let's drop the, the, the philosophy of the ruling class of the, the bourgeoisie at the core center of US transnational hegemony let's 
adopt a perspective from the Puebla, from the people on the periphery of the empire and get a fresh perspective that is rooted in uh, the Puebla, uh, very much like an ideology or philosophy that's rooted in the proletariat. But Dussel wants to make it the Puebla. And so he's modifying that concept of the proletariat. Uh, but this is, this is very nicely connected to a lot of what Dussel's, Dussel's main project of overcoming uh, European modern philosophy uh, by doing like an end run around it uh, connects very directly to this paragraph. So, you know, if you want to write about uh, Dussel's overall philosophical pro project of creating a new grounding of philosophy that jettisons uh, Cartesian modern philosophy in favor of a philosophy rooted in the Puebla, uh, this is a good quote you know, to, to bring in uh, and, and, uh, and uh, work with, okay. When people speak of ideas that revolutionize society, they do but express the fact that within the old society, the elements of a new one have been created and that the dissolution of the old ideas keeps even pace with the dissolution of the old conditions of existence. You know, people lament that uh, the old ways are passing away. Well, that's because the day-to-day -day working conditions have passed away. And you can't, you can't maintain those old cultural standards when you've totally disrupted people's day-to-day -day activity where they spend most of their life. Let's recall, let's remember, let's keep in mind that people, people who have to work, working people that can't survive without working because they've socially been cornered into that position. They have to go to work and they spend most of their life at work. If you alter the place, the works, the workspace where people spend most of their life, you're going to alter the way that they relate to everybody in their life. And to think that you can do one without the other is just a mistake. It's just a confusion. When the ancient world was in its last throes, the ancient religions were overcome by Christianity. This is the fall of the Roman Empire. When Christian ideas succumbed in the 18th century to rationalist ideas, the deism that I talked about and the enlightenment of Kant and, and Hume, uh, feudal society fought its death battle with the revolutionary bourgeoisie. The ideas of religious liberty and freedom of conscience merely gave expression to the sway of free competition within the domain of knowledge. So just like the bourgeoisie wanted to have free competition amongst capitalists, they also want to have free competition among religions. And there you get the unraveling of the old religious and cultural order. Undoubtedly, it will be said, religious, moral, philosophical, philosophical and juridical ideas have been modified in the course of historical development. But religion, morality, philosophy, political science, and law constantly survive this change. Yeah, there's still philosophy, but the individual philosophical ideas have been re revolutionized. There are besides eternal truths such as freedom. Okay, and this is the bourgeois. He puts this in quotes. Uh, they put this in quotes. Uh, the bourgeois say, but there are besides eternal truths such as freedom, justice, etc., that are common to all states of society. But communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion, all morality, instead of constituting them on a new basis. It therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experience. What does this accusation reduce itself to? The history of all past society has consisted in the development of class antagonism. Antagonisms that assume different forms at different epochs. Just as we've said earlier. That's all that amounts to. But whatever, whatever form they may have taken, one fact is common to all past ages. Uh, uh, explicitly, the exploitation of one part of society by the other. 
No wonder then that the social consciousness of past ages, despite all the multiplicity and variety it displays, moves within certain common forms of class antagonism or general ideas, which cannot completely vanish except with the total disappearance of class antagonisms. Those commonalities are based in class antagonisms. We're going to do with away with class antagonisms. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional property relations. No wonder that it is, its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. The so ideas rest upon the substructure of property relation and relations of production. But let us have done with the bourgeois objections to communism. We have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling as to win the battle of democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest by degrees all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, in other words, of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total of productive forces as rapidly as possible. Okay, so notice that communists do not want to go backwards. They want to go forward and actually make industrial production operate on a grander scale than it ever has before. So it's a very forward-looking industrialist uh, attitude that sees industrial production as a, as a means to actually making life better for everybody. Uh, uh, but we do here see, see the, the role of the state as, as uh, Engels and Marx see it, is that the means of production are going to be taken away from the bourgeoisie and put in the hands of the state, democratically controlled by the proletariat. Uh, so here's where you have state uh, control of the means of production. and um, but this is all predicated on the proletariat being organized as the ruling class, which rules the state through democracy, so that like parliamentary bodies would be dominated by proletariat uh, concerns, not by bourgeois concerns, as it is in this day and all the way to our day. Um, even though maybe we're not living in the bourgeois order still, right? The, the, there's always that question out there uh, that we still have to address. That I mentioned earlier in, in this reading of the Communist Manifesto. Of course, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of property, on the conditions of bourgeois production, by means of, of measures, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and untenable, but which in the course of the movement outstrip themselves uh, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order and are unavoidable as a means of entirely re revolutionizing the mode of production. So here they're talking about the dictatorship of the proletariat, that there will be some sort of revolution take place, proletariat forms itself as a ruling class, appropriates the property of the bourgeoisie, rules the state in some kind of a dictatorial fashion to the extent that the people who belong to the proletariat will organize the state and the and the conditions of production to serve the mass majority and not serve the bourgeoisie that's what's dictatorial N not that it's going to be uh, dictatorial where it's a minority ruling the vast majority what they're talking about is the dictatorship of which is the majority, so that through democratic processes, um, bourgeois class privilege will not be allowed to exist. So uh, that's something to think about. I mean, do you believe in bourgeois class privilege, or do you believe that some people should have a certain privilege just by being born uh, in the right family? Do they deserve certain privileges, especially to property? Uh, that other people don't. And of course, if you belong to one of these privileged um, families, which you might, then you might feel that way. But if you're like the vast majority of people, you may not feel that way. 
and and then uh, the question is how do you philosophically defend one position or another. Um, these measures will of course be different in different countries. Nevertheless, in the most advanced countries, the developed countries, the following will be pretty generally accept, uh, ap applicable. Abolition of property. So this is their kind of, uh, what is it? 6.7 point, 10 points. They got a 10 point plan of how in a developed country like England, in 14 or 1848, uh, this is what they suggest. Abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. They just don't allow landlords. Have the state be the landlord and, and the state can collect rents and then use it for public works. Two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Those who make more get taxed at a higher rate. Those who make very little get taxed at nothing. Uh, and everywhere in between. So that it discourages people from bringing in big salaries way beyond everybody else. And we're talking about the 1% here. Uh, the 1% uh, even on yearly income, to be part of the 1% in the United States right now, you would have to make approximately $500,000 a year. Uh, so that's the kind of, we we'll, communists want to tax people who are making $500,000 a year at a higher rate so that everybody else can be taxed at a lower rate. Are you okay with that or does that seem somehow wrong to you? Why does somebody need to make $500,000 a year for one thing? <clears throat> Abolition of all right of inheritance. So you can't pass on bourgeois property from one generation to the next. Again, this is bourgeois property. This is not your watch. This is not your shoes. This is not your, your favorite piece of furniture or that special necklace that your grandma gave you that's not the kind of property. We're talking about bourgeois property that you don't have unless you happen to be rich. Uh, so inheritance is about inheritance of bourgeois big property, country estates, factories, uh, transnational corporations that are largely owned by one person, this kind of stuff is not to be inherited. Confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. If somebody leaves the country or rebels against the country, then their property gets confiscated. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and the exclusive monopoly. Okay, so that uh, credit is not managed by private corporations trying to make a killing off of you, but is managed by the state. Centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Uh, extension of factories and instruments of productions owned by the state. So make more factories owned by the state. Progressively. This is a kind of increment of memos. The bringing into cultivation of wastelands. And I think that's clear from our previous discussions. The improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Equal liability of all to labor. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Okay, equal liability of all to labor means that everybody has to work. There isn't a special privileged class of people that, that get to not work. Do you, do you have a problem with that? Should everybody work or just should there be special people that never have to work? There are special people that never have to work. Should it be that way? combination of agriculture with manufacturing industry, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country, and a more equitable, equitable distribution of the population over the country. So get rid of this country and city thing, have everything much more integrated. Free education for all children in public schools, uh, abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When in the course of development, class distinctions have disappeared and all production has been concentrated in the hands of a vast association of the whole nation, 
the public power will lose its political character. Political power properly so called is merely the organized power of one class for oppressing another. If the proletariat during its, con uh, during its contest with the bourgeoisie is compelled by the force of circumstances to organize itself as a class, if by means of a revolution, it makes itself the ruling class and as such sweeps away by force the old conditions of production, then it will, along with these conditions, have swept away the conditions for the existence of class antagonisms and of classes generally and, there, and, there, and will thereby have abolished its own supremacy as a class. So in the revolution, the proletariat becomes a class and in class antagonism with the bourgeoisie. But once the bourgeoisie have been eliminated, not the individuals, but just the privilege that they enjoy so that they have to come become part of the rest of society. They don't get to not work and take all the wealth. Uh, once they become working people that then share in the wealth with everybody else and can appropriate it just like everybody else can in legitimate ways, then the proletariat won't be a class either. This will be a class of society. Okay. In place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Okay. So we're looking for a classless society in which the free development of each person is the condition for the free development of everyone. Everyone can participate in society. Everyone can appropriate certain products of the society if they do so legitimately. Uh, and that free exercise of their creativity in economic and social relationships is the basis on which everybody is free to do the same. There's not a special class of people that get to not work and enjoy all the rewards. Okay, so that's the end of this uh, second chapter, and then I'll go on to the next chapter.